Well, hello, Grace Church. It is my honor this marvelous Boxing Day to be the one that gets to bring you uh, today's lesson. Uh, I am Micah. I am the youth pastor around here. Uh, and a little bit about me before we get into this. Ever since I was in the 10th grade, I wanted to do student ministry things. Uh, I, was, I started off doing student ministry when I was in 10th grade, and it just became this integral part of who I was. Uh, as I grew in that, uh, in about 2013, so almost a decade ago, uh, I had a, a very impactful conversation as I started to really pursue youth ministry with one of my old student ministry interns. Uh, I called him up. I said, hey, Daniel, I want to do youth ministry. What does that look like? Now, I was 19, so I already knew everything, uh, which meant I already knew what he was about to say, right? Go to seminary. We'll, we'll get a bachelor's degree in something biblical. Uh, go to seminary uh, and go from there. Uh, but the conversation that I thought was going to bring me more assurance and what I already knew actually brought me more confusion. He said, well, what kind of student ministry? And I was kind of dumbstruck, and I, and I asked, what, what, what do you mean, what kind of student ministry? And he said, well, uh, I've done a lot of different student ministry things across the board. I've, I've worked as an intern, and I've worked at a church doing student ministry. And in my mind at that point, I paused, and I went, yeah, that's end of list, right? That's, that's all there is. Uh, but then he went on to my surprise, and he said, well, there's also camp ministry, and I went, oh, how could I, how could I forget camp ministry? I've gone to camp. That's, that's a given. I should have thought of that. And then he said, he kind of turned a corner on me a little bit. He said, I've also done a lot of student ministry while coaching basketball. And I went, pump the brakes. Um, I guess, if it's, I mean, it's a little bit of a stretch to say that. Uh, I guess if you practice at a church or like hang out at a church or invite them to church maybe, um, then I could kind of see how you stretch that. Then he went on though uh, and he said something even more ridiculous. He said, as I did student ministry as a manager at Chick-fil-A. Now I knew he was messing with me, right? Because I get it, I get it. Like Chick-fil-A is what God had when he was creating the uh, the universe and everything, whenever he took a break, they took a break. That's why they're uh, off on Sundays. But surely he was messing with me. This wasn't student ministry at this point anymore, was it? I, I, I didn't, I, saw, I, I ended the phone call. I, I enjoyed talking to him and then I hung up and I dismissed it because <laughs> that's not what student ministry was, right? It was working at a church, uh, doing student ministry at a church and that was student ministry. And I kind of forgot about that until this summer. I remembered that conversation this summer because it kind of brought me some, some peace in a time of mourning. See, uh, I lost one of my old bosses to cancer. Um, he, he was a great boss. I kind of lucked out on the boss department with him. Um, he was my, that was my first real job is working for Tim Miller, uh, and it was a wonderful experience, right? I, I love doing that, and then when I got the news this summer, I realized I didn't just lose an old boss. I lost a friend. I lost a mentor. I, I, I lost someone who really poured into my life. Now, I knew Tim not only from, from work and working for him, but he also went to church with me, so he, he had some really good input on, on my life, uh, gave me some great advice. We joked around a lot, um, sometimes when I should have been working, but uh, since I was with the boss, it was okay, right? That's how that goes. Um, but this summer, Daniel's words, while I was mourning uh, Tim's, uh, the loss of Tim, um, I remember Daniel's words, or God kind of gave me Daniel's words again. And it reminded me that, that whenever I was working for Tim, it wasn't just I was his employee, but I was Tim's ministry also. That not only uh, was I a professional relationship to him, uh, I was a human being, I was a person, I was someone 
that he was going to be Christ to. And so I kind of dealt with, with what, what Tim's legacy was because the, the place I worked, the, whoever took over did not do a good job taking over. But Tim's legacy wasn't just in that restaurant. It was in me and in other employees because it wasn't just me that he had poured into and mentored and loved on. It was his whole staff. And I realized that ministry wasn't just confined to the people that I see in the walls of a church. Ministry wasn't just being a pastor. It wasn't just, you know, working at a church. It was being a blessing to the people around me. It was ministering to the people around me, wherever I was. See, we can't just rely on on the pastors and, and the people that work at the church to do the ministry. No, that's not the job description. That's part of it, but it's not just us. We collectively have to go and make disciples of the world around us. We have to be the the representation of who Jesus is to the world around us. So whether that's being an engineer or a teacher or a student or delivery boy or politician or cleaning person or whatever else you might do, we're supposed to be ministers to the world around us. See, in the Bible, Jesus addresses a group that's not doing this a group that that full-on retreats from from society, um, a a group of Jews. In Luke 16, there's a mention of them. There's a mention of of this small sect of Jews. They're called Essenes. In Luke 16, well, Jesus mentions them in, in Luke 16, doesn't really directly address them anywhere else in Scripture, and even this is kind of an indirect mention. And I'll I'll show you what that is. So starting in verse one in chapter 16, it says, he also said to the disciples, that's Jesus, gathered his disciples, they're hanging out, they're talking. Uh, He says, there was a rich man who had a manager and charges were brought to him that this man was wasting his possessions. And he called him in and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Turn in the account of your management for you can no longer be manager. See, he's not being a good steward. He's not not being a good manager of the owner's possessions. And so naturally, that leads to his termination, him being fired, right? You can't be a manager anymore, turn your badge and leave, right? And the manager said to himself, what shall I do? Since my master is taking the management away from me, I'm not strong enough to dig and I'm, too ashamed to beg. He says, I'm not qualified with, with the, the skills and abilities I have to do anything else but manage this guy's belongings. And so he goes on. He says, I've decided what to do so that when I am removed from management, people may receive me into their houses. So summoning his master's debtors one by one, he said to the first, how much do you owe my master? Now, here's where his plan goes, right? His plan is at best, a little bit sketchy. At worst, like hard embezzlement. He says, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. He said to him quickly, take your bill and sit down and write 50. Now, for those of you that don't know what a measure of olive oil is, because we don't do that kind of conversion anymore. Don't worry, I did the conversions for you. A measure is about eight gallons, so we're talking about 800 gallons uh, of olive oil, which I looked it up the other day, unless you buy it in bulk, which I guess we are, but I'm gonna use the not so in bulk price uh, of $22.99 per gallon. That comes out to $18,392 that this guy owes the master using 2021 stats, right? Prices. Uh, 50 measures would be about $9,000, right? So a $9,000 forgiveness. 
Then he said to another, and how much do you owe? And he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write 80. And a measure is about a thousand bushels or 10,567 gallons, if you're, we're putting that into perspective. A uh, hundred measures, which is 100,000 bushels, would be $775,000 at $7.75 per bushel, which 80 measures, 620,000, which is a $155,000 discount, which is 1,000, excuse me, $164,196 in theft. Now, if you're not familiar with legal codes, uh, that is a federal crime worthy of 20 years in prison and about $3 million in fines. And so this guy, this dishonest manager who should spend, should not be received into these people's houses, but received into the big house. Instead, there's a different result. Like Jesus, Jesus says something that's very confusing. He says, the master commended the dishonest manager for his shrewdness. See, whenever I was younger and I would read this, I would use context clues because I didn't know what commended means. And I would go, the master disciplined, um, uh, punished, the, yelled at the dishonest manager. That's what I thought commended meant for a little while because of this parable. However, that's not what it means. It means he gave him praise. So he not only gets his job back, but he gets a, a pat on the back. Like instead of 20 years in prison, he gets his job back. And so why does he say this? Why does Jesus say this? He says, for the sons of this world are more shrewd in dealing with their own generation than the sons of light. And I tell you, make friends for yourself by means of unrighteous wealth so that when it fails, they may receive you into the eternal dwellings. See, Jesus is saying material possessions that you have, uh, that's not the goal. Those things are meaningless. But instead, use those things, leverage your, your influence to bless the world around you. And Jesus mentions uh, the sons of light, which is a weird, weird way of, of, of speaking. Like, who's, who are these sons of light? Like, we, we get it, like, son of the, sons of the world, like, that's just people of the world. Uh, son of man or son of God, that's Jesus. But who are these sons of light? And that's the Essenes. See, after years and years of their nation getting conquered, of Israel just being the world punching bag, whether that's Babylon and Assyria in the Old Testament, or historically, if that's Alexander the Great of Macedon or General Pompey of Rome. Israel's just been everyone's punching bag. And that's, the, this response from the Essenes is to just withdraw. Because what's happening is God's giving their nation over because their nation is sinning. And so God gives over this perpetually sinful people over to whoever it is. And so they forsake everyone. They go, if, if God is, is punishing our nation for their sinfulness by giving us over to all of these different people, all these different conquerors, then maybe the problem is with the people true, but their response is not to address the wounds and the brokenness of the people around them, but to just full on with, uh, withdraw into a pseudo monastic um, community up on the side of a mountain. They, they forsake everyone. What Jesus is saying in this parable is this guy, at least, at least he's leveraging his influence to bless the world around him. Unlike the Essenes, who know God, who love God, but refuse to love their neighbor. They refuse to love the world around them. And so what we need to not do, what Jesus is saying is we cannot be a seen and not heard. We can't be, I know, it's a bad pun. and I did the whole thing to set that one thing up. 
But that's what Jesus is saying. We cannot be as seen and not heard. As Christians, as, as people, as, as people that, that represent Christ, we cannot be as seen and not heard. We cannot passively live our lives and just go to church on Sundays and Wednesdays um, and just do ministry and just do Christianity there with our Christian friends. We can't full retreat and forsake the Albuquerque around us, the New Mexico, the United States around us, the lost and broken world around us. And so, as I think of that, I think of Colossians 3.17, where Paul says, in all you do, in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus. So again, if that means you're an engineer, if you're a teacher, if you're whatever it is, that means we need to do those things as a representation of Christ and bless the people around us. We have to take an active role in the world around us. Which means we can't give up on any group of people. There's no people group too old or too young or too liberal or too conservative or whatever it is to you that's too far gone. There's, there's no one that we can give up on. See, Tim, Tim didn't give up on any of his employees. When I worked for him, he loved on and was a blessing to all of his employees. At any even point, any set of whatever there was, like 20-ish of us, he loved every single one of us. He was a blessing to all of us. And that ministry left a lasting impact on each of our lives. In the same way, guys, I can't give up. I can't give up on, on the world around us the lost, dying, broken world around us. And I refuse to do so. I refuse to be seen and not heard. And will you join me in doing that? That we can't give up on the world around us. We, as the church, are the hope of the world. Will you too look around at the people in your life and decide and resolve to be a blessing in their life, to be an active blessing to them. God hasn't given up on the people in your life and neither should you. We should collectively resolve to not be a seen and not heard. Let's pray. God, thank you for your son and thank you for all that he's done for us. Uh, thank you for the holiday season. Um, and for Boxing Day. Um, God, I pray that we would resolve to, to not be Essenes, to not just withdraw and, and forsake the world around us and to get in our religious communities and go no further with what you've given us. God, we believe uh, that your church is, is the hope for the world, uh, that we're to be a blessing to the world around us, the lost, the, the hurting, the, the broken world around us. And so I pray that that would be our resolution to uh, take an active role in blessing the people around us. And so uh, I thank you for your word and that we get to come uh, and listen to you and what you have to say through someone like a youth pastor. So uh, thank you for today. I pray this in your name.